Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the Maine State Chamber of Commerce titled Understanding Pine Tree Power. We are pleased also to be doing it with our host chambers from Southern Maine. That's correct. The Southern Maine Chambers of Commerce will be with us today to help us deal with this extremely important issue. Let me also at this time um, also acknowledge that perhaps some confusion has taken place because the Bath Brunswick Chamber of Commerce for years has been labeled and went under the distinction of Southern Mid Coast Maine Chamber of Commerce. While they're obviously very, very welcome, and we look forward to having any and all chambers to be a part of this webinar or any webinar that we deal with this extremely important issue facing our state. It has been uh, actually. Uh, presented by the Southern Maine Chambers of Commerce. So for any confusion that may have arisen, we apologize, but everyone is welcome to be sure. Our goal, our united goal today is to separate fact from fiction, to understand and to distinguish between the promises that have been made and the realities that are possible. My name is Dana Connors. I am pleased to be the moderator as we take an in-depth look at ballot question number three. With the help of our two very distinguished panelists and with your questions, we'll unpack the issues, the impacts, the problems facing our state, our economy, and our people, the taxpayer, the ratepayer, that is, if question three, pine tree power were to pass. But first, it is the Chamber of Commerce that brings this to you with our partners. And I am pleased to ask Linda Caprera, the Vice President of Advocacy. And for the last three or four months before uh, Patrick Woodcock was named as President and CEO, was the interim president and did a wonderful job. Linda? Thank you, Dana. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to say uh, up front that the Maine State Chamber of Commerce strongly opposes Question 3. The threat that Question 3 poses to Maine businesses and Mainers in terms of huge costs is real. It really is. Um, back in 2020, uh, the Chamber made the decision to join the Maine Affordable Energy Coalition, and we're very happy to partner with this coalition again to defeat this measure. Um, I just want to thank our presenting sponsors and our uh, series sponsors. Uh, presenting sponsor is Maine Affordable Energy Coalition, and our series sponsors are Central Maine Power Company, uh, De Delta Dental, Eaton Peabody, Kennebec Savings Bank, and First Light. So again, thank you all um, for coming, and I'll turn it back over to you, Dana. Thanks, Linda. Uh, let me take this time now to introduce our very experienced um, panelists. Jim Cohen and Charlotte Warren. Jim is a long time, shall we say, attorney with Beryl um, Law Firm. And uh, Charlotte Warren also is a long time advocate for people in our state and owns today her own company, which is C. Warren um, uh, Consulting. So they're both actually members of a group called Maine Affordable Energy, which is really a ballot question committee opposed to question three. On the screen, you can see a link for what is Maine Affordable Energy. And let me tell you that it's a very diverse coalition made up of large and small companies, organized labor, trade associations, and thousands, yes, thousands of individual Mainers who are very concerned with the impact that this question has uh, for our state and the people. And we are extremely pleased that both Jim and Charlotte are with us today so that we can learn more about this question and the consequences if it were to pass. Um, I would ask each of them to introduce themselves so that you get to know them a bit better if you don't already know who they are. Jim? Great. First of all, Dana, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thanks to Linda and the Maine State Chamber of Commerce for hosting 
today's webinar okay. on this incredibly important topic. We're pleased to be here today. Uh, as, as Dana said, I've been an energy and utility lawyer for many, many years. Uh, if we're actually counting, it's 32. I'm trying not to count. Uh, I also have a unique perspective that in my practice, I've worked with both investor-owned electric utilities as well as consumer-owned electric utilities. I've worked with solar developers, and that's an important part of what I do today. Uh, I've worked with consumer-owned water districts. And in my spare time, I spent six years on the Portland City Council, served as mayor for a period of time. And, and so as we look at question three and the issues it raises, uh, I have some perspective on, on many of the issues and concerns that we have about question three. So it's great to be here today. Thank you, Jim. Charlotte? Thank you, Dana, and thank you to the Chamber for hosting us. My name's Charlotte Warren, and my by trade, I'm a social worker and an educator. I am the owner of C. Warren Consulting, and I am, a, well, I guess, what Jim calls a recovering uh, politician. Um, I spent all told 22 years as an elected official. I've been a planning board member, a city councilor. I'm the former mayor of Hollowell, and I spent eight years serving in the legislature. I'm also a trustee of the Greater Augusta Utility District and serve on many other boards in my community. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. And thank you both. I might also add that both have a very distinguished career in public service. And if you know them, you know that they are leaders by anyone's definition. So we're very grateful to both that they can be with us today. And I can think of no person or two people that would be better to serve the purpose of today's webinar. And so I want to get on to talk a bit about um, our webinar. But first, there's one other person that, while I won't go into depth in terms of his introduction, he plays a very important role and that's our technical director. It's Peter Close, as, as you've just heard as we opened the show. Peter is with SALT Public Affairs. He's also the deputy chief of staff uh, for the affordable energy uh, for Maine, Maine's affordable energy. And in addition to that, he is a campaign administrator. So in a few moments, Peter is going to have the responsibility of making sure you have the opportunity to ask questions, and if anything technically goes wrong, don't rely on me. He's the man that will help us solve those problems. So let's get back to the webinar. I think I, we would all like very much to have you think of this as a conversation. Um, I will start by asking the panelists, what we'll be voting on this November for question three? We'll then ask, our panelists to talk about some of the high level issues involved if pine tree power were to pass. And then we'll turn to questions from each of you. And I hope you have a number so that we can get to your concerns as well. So let's start uh, with Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte, would you share with us what will be on the November ballot? Great. Thank you, Dana. So um, Jim's going to put up the question. Great. So that's the question number three that you'll see on your ballot. Do you want to create a new power company governed by an elected board to acquire and operate existing for-profit electricity transmission and distribution facilities in Maine? So it's important to understand that although, you know, that's a one sentence question, really, it's backed up by a 15 page document that is actually the question. And let me tell you what, what the proponents have, have put on our ballot. First of all, the proponents of question three are asking us as Mainers to take a huge gamble, a huge risk and something that's never been done anywhere at this level before. They want us as a state to take over two utilities that are not for sale, therefore guaranteeing eminent domain process, litigation that will last five to 10 years is our, our estimation, at a cost of $13.5 billion that we would have to borrow in order to acquire those utilities. 
And then question three puts elected politicians, seven elected politicians, who will then appoint six of their own folks of their choosing to the board, which will then hire a for-profit operator to run the grid. So again, something that's never been tried anywhere before. And you can see Jim has put up, you know, our real concerns about this proposal. As I talked about a decade of legal process and litigation, Jim has experience with when companies are, you know, sort of crammed together in this way and what that process takes. He'll talk about that. 13.5 billion in taxable debt. Um, a revolving door of private for-profit grid operators who would earn 82 million a year in profit. So that's on top of the cost that that we keep. To, it's an additional cost that we need to, you know, to pay attention to. Um, it places 100% of the financial risk on main consumers. Right now, if something goes wrong, shareholders are responsible for backing that up. In this case, there would be no shareholders. It's the people of the state of Maine. If something goes wrong, we're on the hook for that. We need to make up for that, for those dollars. Um, unprecedented, I already talked about, and just really an untenable regular regulatory structure. There are so many unknowns in this proposal. Thanks, uh, Charlotte. You know, it seems that just hearing what you have outlined uh, it's hard to imagine how and why something like this would get by our voters, but you fear that it might. And if it did, Jim, what what would happen next? Sorry, just scrambling for my unmute button. Uh, oh. So... So I think Char outlined very well the major concerns that we have and that voters should have. If Pine Tree Power were to pass, there's been a lot of promises made. But it's important to understand that just as our public advocate came out last month and came out with a neutral stance on Pine Tree Power, but one of the some of the things he noted is that there was nothing in the bill that would improve the quality of our electric service. There's nothing in the bill guaranteeing that our rates would go down. Nothing in the bill would guarantee that our environment would improve. And as Shar mentioned, the other side talks a lot about for-profit companies and money leaving the state of Maine, but yet they put together a ballot question that actually keeps for-profit companies and doesn't prohibit those companies from being out of state or foreign. And You'll hear the other side talk a lot about uh, what Pine Tree Power would mean, and they compare it to some small municipal utilities in Maine. But what's important to understand is they look nothing like the, uh, the utilities uh, that we have in Maine. Pine Tree Power would be completely different. We can talk about that more over the course of, of today's discussion. But what does it mean? I think Char sort of set the table talking about this board and it's important to understand, we can talk all we want about our existing utilities, but what we're voting on is like a charter change. So I served on a, on a charter commission in, in Portland uh, about 12 years ago. We carefully studied uh, how other successful cities our size uh, governed themselves, and we picked a model that was followed by the majority of those cities, successful cities, and we made an incremental change. What Pine Tree Power proposes is the opposite of that. They picked a model that is in place in only two jurisdictions nationally. That's Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority and Long Island Power Authority, unsuccessful in both places. And not an incremental change, but rather a massive change that overhauls our entire electric industry. So it starts with eminent domain, which is an extraordinary concept that we, the voters of Maine, would be voting to actually take over two private companies. That is extraordinary. It's never happened before. 
those 13 board members Shar talked about, this, the seven elected board members, the only qualification to be one of those board members is that you're 21 years of age and that you live in the district. That's it. Those seven would in turn appoint six more. And collectively, those six have to have certain management and technical skills. But the way the question is phrased, if only one of those six happen to possess all of those criteria, then there's no criteria at all governing the remaining five. Moreover, there's no check and balance. There's no process to question whoever those seven politicians appoint. So we'll have 13 board members, only one of which will each of us vote on. The other 12, we won't have any control over. They will in turn hire a staff. That staff will be the director, the executive director, the finance director, the, uh, the outside counsel, the general counsel, the accountants, the engineers. So full, full bureaucracy. Collectively, that's pine tree power. They will own the utility assets. They will be in control of it. They in turn will hire a for-profit private company. So it's, it's those two things, the government control in the for-profit private operation that we're signing ourselves up for that is unique. Dana, the other thing that would happen if question three were to pass is a it would put in motion a chain of events. And I'm just going to go through that quickly. So I know this is a very busy slide and apologize, but that's what's in those 15 pages that Charlotte talked about. So we start on the left-hand side which is the election that we have this November. So if it passes, we then a year from November, we would be electing our first board. That board uh, would be elected officials. There would be campaign spending. There could be spending by private special interests. Uh, they would earn up to $40,000 a year which is three times what a state legislator makes today and a little more than double what they'll make uh, if, uh, if there are increases as proposed this past session. And they'll have anywhere from uh, you know, months to 18 months to figure out how to take over CMP in person. So the, the question is not optional. They don't decide whether or not to take over CMP. It's mandated that they take over both utilities. They'll have to select those six other board members. And then sometime in 2026, conservatively, the process of taking over CMP and Versant would begin. Now, as we know, there have been wildly divergent estimates on how much CMP and Versant are worth. When we're talking about that kind of divergence in opinion, the likelihood that there is a, an agreement over the value is extraordinarily small. So litigation is likely. Last month, our public advocate said that this process would take anywhere from five to 10 years. On average, the process takes 10 years, the handful of times that any of these takeovers on the local level have occurred. And Long Island, which was one of the utilities I mentioned earlier, there actually was no litigation involved. It took 13 years. But we're assuming that there will be litigation. And when there is, I can talk about my own personal experience in the mid 1990s representing two small water companies, one in Rangeley, one in Winter Harbor, taken over by legislatively created water districts. The only issue was how much are those water utilities worth? It took three and a half years of litigation in the 90s before the main law court finally determined the value. So Given that we're talking two large electric utilities, statewide, billions of dollars, and it's been 25 years since those litigation uh, occurred, and litigation has gotten longer, not shorter, five years is a conservative estimate of how long it would take before our main law court finally determines how much we're responsible for to pay to acquire CMP and Versant. So essentially what we're being asked to do is in November of 2023, write a blank check 
and we wouldn't be filling in the amount of that blank check until sometime in 2031 or beyond. Meanwhile, the governor's 2030 climate action plan comes and goes, and we're spending our time focused on who owns the grid, not how best to operate the grid. And by the way, during that entire time, the dollars go onto our electric bill. Question three says every single dollar that's spent, and it will be tens of millions of dollars go on our electric bills. So when we fill in that blank check, we think that number is $13.5 billion. It's sort of like going into a car dealer and looking at a car that you don't know whether it will work. You don't know the price. And you tell the dealer, I'd like to buy that car. And maybe in seven or eight years, tell me how much I owe. And then getting the bill seven or eight years later and finding out that it's $13.5 billion. That's not a way to buy a car. It's not a way to buy utility. And it's not how we should be doing business with question three. And only at that point in 2031 will we then start the process of who is that private grid operator? We don't know who it will be. Uh, the Public Utilities Commission did a study several years ago and said there are very few of these private grid operators. So there's not even a guarantee that we'll find one. And then eventually, let's say we're fortunate enough to find such an operator, most likely it will be an out-of-state company because they have to be qualified and there are no in-state companies other than CMP and Versant uh, capable of running a utility. So we're looking at 2033 before we actually are flipping the switch and some new company that we don't know is operating the grid. And if anyone remembers the Fairpoint takeover of Verizon's assets uh, back in the uh, early 2000s, that went very poorly. When you talk about a system as complex as a telephone system or an electric system with all of the software, all of the facilities, it doesn't take much to go wrong to crash the system. And that's what we'll be looking at in 2033. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Shad, I wanna go back to you for a moment. Jim had mentioned that there weren't a lot of operators that one could seek their service. Um, what can be said about what other states have done uh, or has this been done before? whether it's the small community-based consumer-owned or a more state-level uh, type of operation? I'm so glad you asked that question because really this, we would be really a, a, a very large guinea pig, right? This At this level, a state-level takeover of their two existing utilities, this has never been tried before. The other thing that's interesting, Dave, Dana, is when the proponents of question three talk about their question, you know, they try to talk about this as a pure consumer owned utility, right? They're trying to sell it as sort of a co-op. The Supreme Court was really clear. This cannot be called a consumer owned utility. It is not one right? That combination of the elected board and hiring the private for-profit company, it just disallows it from being called what they're calling it. The other, or what they're trying to call it, what they wanted the question to call it, right? And that was why the Supreme Court needed to rule or the law court needed to rule is because Pine Tree Power sued to try to get consumer-owned utility put in the question. And the court said no. That's not what this is. Well, that has not deterred them. They they try to, in our debates with them, in our forums with them, they are constantly trying to call it something it's not. But something that's a little more nefarious is that they are only, only comparing it to the utilities, the small consumer-owned utilities that they like in the state. They cherry pick right? They they want to paint this picture that all of these utilities that a consumer owned are lower rates and better service. And that's just not true. The reason they're, they're you know, projecting that data is because they're cherry picking which ones to talk about. And, and that's, you know, I don't remember right now who said it, but we can disagree, right? Uh, we can disagree on our opinion of something, but we can't disagree on the facts. The facts are the facts are the facts. And that's really something that's unfortunate with the proponents is they're not telling the whole story. 
So, so it's really important for people to understand this would be like nothing anybody has ever seen before at a very large debt. And that's one of the things that sends up alarm bells for us. Yeah, you both make a very convincing case uh, as to why we should vote no uh, on this question in November the 7th. But I'm sure that our listeners have questions, our audience have questions that they'd like to ask of each of you. So don't go far. We want you right back here to help us with that. And I'm going to ask Peter to share with our listeners, our audience, how they can access their questions so that they get what they need to know to each of you. Thanks, Dana. Uh, as I just put in the chat, uh, which you can uh, read by clicking the chat button at the bottom of your screen, um, if you'd like to ask Jim and Shar a question uh, or have Dana ask them a question, um, raise your hand with the raise hand function uh, or put it in the Q&A box by clicking that button uh, just to the left of raise hand. Um, if uh, once we get to your questions, if you if your hand is raised, I will then uh, opt to bring you live uh, and bring you up as a panelist. Uh, and after uh, you accept, uh, and there's a brief pause as you load back into the call, um, you should turn your camera on, turn your microphone on, and then ask your question. Um, if you prefer to have your question asked for you, uh, please just type into the Q and A box. Um, and one thing I will say, if we bring you live, uh, please make sure to keep your questions brief and succinct so we can get to as many as possible. Um, but if you have loads of questions, put them all in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. Thank you, I'll Peter. I'll turn it back to you, Dana. Yeah, thanks. And with that, uh, I'm hopeful that you will have questions that we can ask of Jim and Charlotte. We refer to as Char, but because I have a granddaughter whose name is Charlotte, and I like both my <laughs> daughter as well as Char, I'm going I'm to stick with Charlotte. Perfect. So do any of you have any questions? I'm sure that as convincing as they were, there may be something that's on your mind that perhaps we haven't touched upon. Um, I have one to get us started. Thirteen and a half billion seems like an enormous amount of money, and it is, particularly if the responsibility lies with you and I and the taxpayer or the rate payer. How did we get to that place? Jim, I toss that to you. Yeah, thanks, Dana. Let me just see if I can throw uh, a slide up uh, on that point. Uh, hopefully everyone can see. So. Just the starting point to understand why the number 13.5 billion is being used and why we think that that is a more accurate number for what CMP and Verson are worth, we have to go back to 2020. The Maine legislature directed the Maine Public Utilities Commission to do a study on this proposal. At the time, that proposal was called the Maine Power Development Authority, the legislature said, this is really complicated. Before we could act on it, we should do a study about it. And so this, this study was done by a group called London Economics International. Uh, London Economics International said, this is going to cost a lot of money. Uh, there are a lot of assumptions that go in. We can make some educated guesses, but it could be very different uh, as the assumptions change. And by the way, we should do some further study. Ultimately, the uh, legislature adjourned, adjourned because of COVID back in 2020, never did the further study. And so Pine Tree Power came back with this new, newly branded name, Pine Tree Power, uh, a new marketing term as a consumer-owned nonprofit company. It is neither a nonprofit, nor is it consumer-owned, nor is it a company and now it's labeled pine tree power. So that study back in 2020 said, if the takeover were to occur in 2024, based on certain assumptions, the constitutional fair market value of the two utilities would be only $8.2 billion. However, that assumed a 2024 takeover. A moment ago, we talked about what the timeline would look like with pine tree power and we're most likely into 2030, 2031. 
So the first thing we did is we changed the variable of when the takeover occurred. We used the exact same process and formula and methodology that the PUC study used, and we plugged in 2030. Because over the course of six years, there's new poles, there's new wires, there's new substations, and the value goes up. It's what the value will be. The next variable is what is the multiplier of book? If you sell or buy a house and you do an appraisal, what you're looking for is what are comparable sales? So in this case, our main law court said that the way you figure out a comparable sale of utility is you look at how much did somebody pay for the utility versus its net book value, and there's a multiplier. So the Public Utilities Commission said, if you assume 1.5 times the net book value and assume 2024, you have 8.2 billion. But if you just change that assumption to two, you get 13.5. And the reason that we believe two times net book value is a more comparable number is because if you look at the three most recent takeovers, of private utilities, and the, again, these are all small on the local and county level, the multiplier was on the low end, 2.1, went up as high as 5.5. So those two assumptions, two times net book value in 2030, that gets us to $13.5 billion. If the multiplier is higher or the takeover dates later, that number could be even higher than 13.5. But we won't know for sure until a court determines that in about seven or eight years. We do have a question uh, from the audience that asks, that really gets to the issue of rates. The other side speaks often of the promise of rates coming down. Um, Char Charlotte, you spoke to other places and their experience, but here in Maine, and the specific question was, um, what about Kennebunk? power and light, what will happen to them or what's their experience? So can you speak about the, the existing in our state of Maine, their experiences with rates and how it would compare relevantly relevant to the question before us on November the 7th? And want, did you, yes, Sharp. Sure. Great. Yeah. I think first of all, it's important, as I said before, to recognize that some consumer owned, some of these smaller municipal consumer owned have higher rates and some have lower rates. Some have better service and some have worse service. So really you can't you can't just jump them all into one group. It's it's not possible because they're all so different. They also are not the same as what's being proposed. So that I just really think that's important, we can't use those existing municipals as a yardstick for this measure because what we're voting on is nothing like those. Again, the proponents want to use those examples, but they're not good comparisons. Secondly, I wanna talk about the cost a little more. Jim and I are traveling all over the state doing a lot of debates and forums with the proponents of question three. When they handed in their signatures in January, you know, they said the cost was $9 billion. Recently in a television interview, the campaign manager sort of got pushed into the fact that it's about $10 billion. When I was in a debate with the campaign manager three weeks ago in Augusta, they said, we don't know what the cost is. So those are three different things. But here's the truth. They can talk a lot about how much we're going to save. But if you don't know how much it's going to cost, you can't know what the savings are, right? We're all business owners here. We understand that. If we do not know what the cost of something is going to be, it is impossible to calculate what the savings will be. That's just common sense. So I say, I make that point to say that, first of all, it's really dangerous that they want us to buy something that they are unwilling to tell us the price for. 
second of all, and I'm sorry to say this, but it's just an example of how disingenuous the proponents of question three are being. If they can't tell us what the cost is, it's impossible for them to tell us, I don't know what they're saying, something, you know, 367 a year. Where is that coming from? And if you can't back up your numbers, should we trust those numbers? It's, you know, it's this idea of, of us writing a blank check. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Dana, the other thing I would add, uh, as, as I said, I've been in this business for, for a long time and I have the affliction of being a lawyer and sometimes getting a little bit too much into the weeds, but at the, at the risk of getting a little into the weeds, it's still important that when we talk about these small consumer-owned districts in Maine, take Kennebunk, for example. It's a very small utility. It's a very well-run utility. It has seven line workers and 44 line miles. I was on a panel with their general manager a little over a year ago, and he talked about how if they were to scale up just to serve York County, the, the numbers wouldn't work. It, it's completely different. And if you look in, in Maine, there was only one utility that looks anything like CMP or Versant and is consumer owned, and that's Eastern Maine Electric Cooperative, where their rates are pretty comparable to CMP and Versant, and their service quality on average has been lower than CMP because of their size. So size is really important. So you can't really compare these small municipal ones, which Pine Tree Power tries to do. And then if you really wanna get into the weeds, those big overhead lines that we see throughout the state, CMP and Versant have them. We pay for them. Those small water, those small electric utilities don't even have them, so they don't have to pay for them. We've spent a lot of time talking about net energy billing and stranded costs that end up on our bill because of policy set in Augusta. Well, the, the consumer-owned utilities in Maine managed to get themselves exempted from those additional environmental requirements. And so CMP and Versant customers have to pay those costs, whereas those consumer owns don't. The other thing is Pine Tree Power starts out in a financial hole, mm -hmm. a $13.5 billion hole of debt, which could be in excess of half a billion dollars of interest payments in principal a year. None of those consumer-owned utilities are starting out in a financial hole because they started as consumer-owned utilities. They don't have that initial debt. And finally, none of those consumer-owned utilities have a private grid operator, who, by the way, when we go to a private grid operator, according to the PUC, we'll be paying $82 million a year more in cost. It's sort of like if you mow your lawn yourself, you pay for the gas, you buy your lawn mower, you go mow your lawn. Or you can hire a lawn service and you're going to pay a whole lot more to have your lawn mowed. Essentially, what Pine Tree Power does is say, instead of running our own electric utility, we're going to hire someone else to do it and we're going to pay them the markup. We'll be paying that uh, for forever as long as that model is in place. Yeah, and Dana, I think I missed the first part of your question. I didn't answer. So let me go back to it. No, Kenny Bunk Power and Light would not be taken over by Pine Tree Power. They are, their plan, if it were to pass, is to only take over ownership of Central Maine Power and Versant. So the others would not change. So I wanted to circle back to get that. Thank you. I was going to circle back. So you read my mind. Thank you. <laughs> um, but while we're staying on rates, there's another point to be made here. Um, the acquisition is about CMP and Versant, both of whom are uh, transmission and distribution companies. And yet when people on the other side talk about rates, they don't make a distinction between generation and transmission and distribution. And I think it's important, even though we probably, many of us know that, there's a lot either who don't know it or take advantage of the fact that people don't know it. So would you spend a couple of minutes just speaking to the significance of the two parts of that bill and what's affected today by transmission and distribution on this question 
versus when you add in the generation as well? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, so I think it, I ask a lot of groups this question and, 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 and some folks are aware, uh, but many Mainers aren't aware because we get a bill every month. It has a bottom line, we pay that bottom line. But behind that bill is different parts of the system. And we made a decision as a state, our, our legislature voted and ultimately passed legislation in 1997 that took the wires part of the business and kept those with our existing utilities, but then said that the creation of electricity, the generation of electricity, that's gonna be in a competitive market and it won't be with our utilities anymore. And they had to sell off all of their power plants. And so when you get your electric bill, the biggest part of your bill is the supply portion, which CMP and Versant include on their bills, but they're simply collecting the money and paying it off to some other generating company. And then there's taxes, there's fees to run efficiency main, all of those things that uh, are, are separate from distribution. So the, the part of the business that we're talking about selling or, or taking over by eminent domain is just the wires portion. All of us have been struggling to pay our electric bills in the last several years. And the reason is that supply portion that I mentioned a moment ago. So in this chart, the orange bars are the supply. It has gone up tremendously. It is the biggest part of our electric bill. And what's been disappointing is that the Pine Tree Power campaign has been out saying, your rates have gone up tremendously, switch to Pine Tree Power and they'll go down. But most of those increases came from a portion of the bill in a business that Pine Tree Power won't be taking over and won't have any control over. And that's been disappointing. Yeah, there have been a few rate increases uh, over the years by CMP and Versant in line with what you'd expect with inflation. And any increase that CMP or Versant puts in place can't happen unless there has been a very detailed rate case approved by the Public Utilities Commission. Usually it's almost a year long process to increase those, those rates. And the final thing I would say is if you look at your own bill, only 13% of our electric bill is even affected by pine tree power. The portion that is affected is the capital. And so you'll hear the pine tree power advocates say, oh, if the government owns our utility, they can borrow for a whole lot less. Well, let me tell you, according to the Public Utilities Commission study, there's a small reduction in borrowing costs going forward, but much, much smaller difference than what Pine Tree Power advocates say. At the same time, we will have $13.5 billion in debt. We will have that new $82 million a year or more management fee. You combine those two things, and the net effect is a tremendous increase in our electric rates. And when you think about it, if our electric rates go up, that means we're paying more directly. The cost of our groceries go up because they use electricity. Our water bills go up because our treatment plants are run on electricity. Our tax bills go up because local and state government use electricity. There'll also be some savings in income taxes. Yeah, Pine Tree Power won't have to pay income taxes anymore. But guess what? When they stop paying in income taxes, the state government is going to come right back at us and ask uh, that anything we save out of one pocket, we're going to be spending out of the other pocket. So this is a formula for all of our costs, all of our taxes to go up. It's made. Um, Peter, I don't want to overlook any questions, but help me. Are there some uh, in the chat room that I am not seeing? I don't know. Yes, we have another one here uh, from Pat, who's asking about uh, tree trimming and uh, the effect of pine tree power on uh, what causes many of the outages in the state. Jim, I know this is an issue area that I've heard you talk about plenty of times. Yeah, th thanks, Peter and Pat. Thanks, thanks for the question. 
you know, a lot of promises are being made about mm. pine tree power. Our power goes out. Sometimes we wonder, you know, why did our power go out? Well, it turns out that about 87% of all power outages are caused by trees falling on lines. And Maine happens to be the most forested state in the country. So it stands to reason that whether it's pine tree power or CMP or Versant, there will still be trees. The second point, 82% of those trees are actually outside of the right-of-way that CMP or Versant own and control. So again, whether it's CMP, Versant, or pine tree power, there will be trees that we can't trim that will ice over in the winter and fall on our wires and knock out power. Otherwise, it's cars driving into poles, it's animals on the lines, all of those things continue to be the place uh, where the causes of power outages. But it's also worth noting that what Pine Tree Power will say is, well, if we're in control of the grid, then we can invest more. That's an important point. And the 2020 PUC study said, that's exactly right. If you want better reliability, you need to pay for it. It doesn't come magically just because you change who owns the grid. We would need to pay for that additional reliability. And the politicians of Pine Tree Power will have to decide, do they have the political will to make that investment? Look at our roads, look at our bridges. Dana, you're a former DOT commissioner. I'm sure you would have appreciated as much money as needed to make sure that our roads were kept in the condition needed, but it relies on politicians agreeing to fund the roads as we need them. And the question is, will the politicians of Pine Tree Power have the political will to make the investments? Which is why our public utilities, uh, our, our uh, public advocate said recently, there's actually a chance of underinvestment because of political pressure. And our uh, many former Public Utilities Commission chairs have come out against Pine Tree Power for some of that same concern, that political pressures lead to underinvestment in the grid, underinvestment in reliability, underinvestment in grid modernization that we need to improve environmental performance. So just because you change who owns the grid, far from a valid assumption is that things improve. If anything, they would go in the other direction. Yeah, and in the short time we have left, you speak to another concern that you hear more and more being expressed today, and that is, and you touch upon it when you make the case of, will they have the will and will they have the money to be able to make those investments? And what the, the criticism seems to be based around a plan. There is no plan being talked about uh, that's going to address the maintenance. There's no plan being talked about that's going to address the environmental concerns of climate change and so forth. And um, no plan whatsoever to deal with uh, upgrading our access. They may talk of our grid access. They may talk about it, but there's no plan that that any company obviously has when they look to the future, absent none in this case. So I'd ask you to quickly respond to that as we uh, tend to wrap up this particular webinar. I'd ask you both for that. I think that's a really astounding part of this whole process we're in, is how something that is so important and so central to everyone's lives, and for some of us, so much more central, right? When we think about the folks who are dealing with a disease like diabetes, where they have to have insulin and they have to make sure that it's refrigerated or folks who are, you know, dealing with a medical condition that requires that they have some sort of machine that's run by electricity. For many folks in our state, this is life or death. This is really, really serious stuff. And so it's astounding to me that the proposal was just, quite frankly, written so poorly, where a lot of what they talk about and a lot of the a lot of the promises that they share with many of us, they're just in the company purpose of the bill. 
And you can check out the bill on the Secretary of State's website. The company purpose is basically like a letter to Santa Claus, right? It's like, I want all these things to happen. I would like these things under the tree. And, but then it's not put into the legal language where it's measurable, enforceable, and we have some teeth around it. So there is no plan. We, we constantly at our debates and forums are trying to get the proponents to answer these questions. What about this? What about this? And, and it hasn't been considered. And the question doesn't consider the importance of a plan. And I think that is one of the pieces that we are so concerned about are all of the many ways this could go wrong. And if this went wrong, there are no shareholders to back it up, right? There are no shareholders who will then be responsible to fund the fix. That fix is on all of us. It's on all of us. That's very scary. And there are multiple opportunities, unfortunately, for this to go wrong because we haven't planned properly or the proponents haven't planned properly. You know, and Governor Mills uh, two years ago came out and vetoed a similar bill, and, and she reiterated her opposition last month, called this a rosy solution to a complex problem. She talked about the bill as a patchwork of political promises. She talked about uh, lengthy litigation distracting us from achieving our carbon reduction goals. She talked about unqualified uh, politicians running the grid. And Governor Mills and Governor LePage may not agree on many things, but one thing they agree on is that pine tree power is a bad idea. Organized labor and business don't always see eye to eye on issues, but they agree that pine tree power is a bad idea, including our local workers for CMP and Versant, because they feel that pine tree power is going to worsen service quality and worsen the state of our electric system in Maine. And they're very concerned. And to Charlotte's point about bankruptcy and, and the buck stopping with us, that actually happened with Eastern Maine Electric Cooperative right here in Maine. Mm -hmm. Because Eastern Maine Electric Cooperative invested in Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant in the early 1980s. Cost overruns exceeded their ability to repay those debts. And so they went bankrupt. And who paid for that bankruptcy? The consumers of Eastern Maine Electric Cooperative. There was no shareholder to protect, to protect those utilities. So they had some of the highest rates in the state. Similar thing happened in Texas with uh, the cold snap. It was the consumer owned utilities that had the financial shock and one of them went bankrupt whereas the investor-owned ones were, were, were safe. Another reason our Public Utilities Commission chairs have come out against Pine Tree Power, because they understand the risk now falls to us. Unexpected storms, fewer sales than we expect, 100% of that risk falls to us, the consumer, which is just one of many reasons why question three is a terrible idea for the state of Maine. On those very effective points, uh, I choose to bring this webinar to a close. And as they say, drop the mic. Uh, I, I can't thank our panelists enough. Uh, you brought this issue front and foremost and is the very reason the State Chamber of Commerce, and we hope that all of you who are participating today will see it in the same way, that this proposal put forward by Pine Tree uh, power is one that is risky, it's uncertain, has tremendous cost, whether it's cost to the taxpayer, it's a cost to the management being run by elected politicians, and perhaps a case we made partisan politicians, and certainly to our environmental and other investments that are being made. It's hard to believe that this is something that our people uh, will accept. My hope is that people that have heard the promises made and the distinction that they are not reality as we see them and they will not help our state but move it backwards in so many different ways we would hope you would see it the same way we would hope you'd pass the information on peter has provided
both the governor's statement, but also ways that you can get information about what you've heard here today. And remember this, um, more than anything else, pine tree power question three is really an extreme experiment. One that will be our children and grandchildren that will, whose lives and businesses and many other ways of life will be mortgaged to pay what this question three proposes to do. So with that, I thank everybody for joining us, our panelists in particular, uh, but also our sponsors who help make this possible uh, to present to all of you. Thank you very much. That's a wrap. <laughs>